Hello, and thank you for joining us for another Wednesdays in the Word, and really excited again about the time we've spent in this series, The Big Questions of Life. We are winding down to our final few questions. I thought today's question was very important, particularly coming out of Resurrection Sunday, and this being a post-Resurrection Sunday uh, presentation. I hope that you had a great Resurrection Sunday or Easter Sunday. And Easter is a great time in which we bring out the new outfits, get into the spring, have a great time with the kids, all that kind of stuff. But I hope we don't miss the central purpose and meaning of the Resurrection Sunday, that we serve a God who is alive. And so I'm really excited about this question uh, that we're going to deal with today. We've kind of dealt with it in previous um, Wednesday in the Word uh, uh, YouTube podcast, but but I'm really thinking we need to always come back and deal with it from time to time because it's a hot question. It's one of two questions that the culture are Googling about God. And here is what the question is. If God is so real, why is there so much suffering? Thank you for joining us again. And this question still remains the number one Googled question uh, around the globe. I mean, this is not something people are asking in America. This is around the globe. If God is real, if God is so good, why does he allow so much suffering? And the second question, I'll throw it out there. We've dealt with it before. If God is so real, why is he so hidden? In other words, people seek him out but he seems to be hidden. But why is there so much suffering? And is there a conflict that a good God would allow suffering? And I want to address that because I think there's an assumption that God should be in the world for my purpose. And therefore, if God is truly real, he should create a world or a heaven where it fits my reality without any responsibilities to him. And that that just doesn't fit any religious system around the world, let alone the Christian uh, view or worldview. And so this is a huge obstacle. Uh, people have issues with the droughts that take place in third world, uh, world countries um, uh, or even lives that may be lost innocently, like, for example, in wars like we're seeing in the Gaza Strip with Israel or even to a drunk driver um, or even individuals or children that are born with some kind of brain deficiency. These are the questions people are asking. And I think it's a fair question. It's a fair question. If if God is so good and real, why are we having it? I think it's the wrong question to start with, but that's the question people are asking. And so the assumption is, is that suffering or evil and a good God could not possibly coexist. And yet we know we live in a world where there's good people and bad people. So good people and bad people coexist every single day. But yet somehow it's inconceivable that a good God that rules all would somehow coexist with a world that's full of evil people or even full of suffering. And the truth is, as many writers have articulated here, is we live in a culture, particularly in the American Western culture, that does not allow for suffering because the supreme value or principle is personal freedom. And as Christians, I think we have to be careful. Yes, we're privileged to live in a country that cherishes individual freedoms. But many times if we're not careful, we can take it to such an extreme that it even flies in the face of our faith. The truth is, when we came to Christ, the scriptures clearly see there's no, clearly says there's no slave or free. And Paul was preaching the gospel in a time when people had free citizenship as well as slavery was real. And Paul comes in with the gospel and says, look, our ultimate accountability and responsibility is to God. There's no slave or free. There's no, no idea. And we've gone all the way to the other extreme and says, look, God ought to be in my life to service my freedoms. And, and that's kind of where we are in the world. And it's a cultural reality. And I think many times if we're not careful, 
uh, it can seep into the church in a sense, and we can even spiritualize it in a way that God only works unless he's blessing my life. And so we have to be careful with that reality. So the whole meaning of life in a secular world is individual freedom. Uh, one writer says it like this, there's no higher good than the right and freedom to decide for yourself uh, what you think, what is good. Therefore, suffering infringes on our individual freedoms. And so this idea of any kind of suffering that blocks my personal pursuit for pleasure uh, somehow is, is, is something that should not exist. And likewise, suffering in a sense kind of blocks that. When you go through challenges, when you go through suffering, it blocks this pursuit for the ultimate uh, experience of pleasure. And this doesn't mean as Christians, we ought to be gluttons for suffering. I surely am not looking forward to any kind of suffering. I do anything in my life to minimize it. But it doesn't mean that the power of the gospel does not give us strength to overcome suffering. That's what we see that we just celebrated this, this past Passion Week. Christ died on Friday, rose from the dead on Sunday. And there's a word there that it doesn't promise us to, the gospel doesn't promise us or Christianity doesn't promise to exempt us from challenges or suffering, but we can overcome. We can, we can still have joy in the midst of whatever we're going through. That is the power of the resurrection. That is the power of God's presence in our lives. And so we want to just look at uh, four elements, at least from a Christian worldview, as to why a good God, why our God would allow suffering and what exactly is his purpose. And so number one, suffering is God's way of connecting with the world. Suffering is God's pathway of connecting with the world. And that's exactly why Jesus comes. He comes into the world as well as to give us compassion to let us know that God also identifies with our suffering. He connects with us. He walks with us. It's not that he doesn't have the power to overcome suffering, but what he does to prove to death, evil, and the devil that he can enter into suffering and use our suffering and turn it into something good. That's exactly what we see in the gospel. That's exactly what we see in Christ dying on the cross and rising from the dead. He doesn't run from suffering. He doesn't snap his fingers and cause suffering to disappear. He doesn't use some miracle that the cross disappears. No, but he uses the cross, which becomes the basis for redemption of all humanity for those who trust Christ. But then also, too, he gives us a pathway to walk. That suffering has not, does not have to define us. Suffering does not have to defeat us and suffering surely does not have to stop us from walking with Jesus for the destiny he has for us. And so God uses suffering as a pathway and on ramp into on ramp into the human experience. And so we see this in John chapter 11, verse 35, where it says Jesus wept. And, and surely this is the story, this, the phrase, these two words come out of the story of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead in, in John chapter 11. He surely could have gotten there in time and healed him where he never would have died, but he just would have healed him to delay the inevitable. Matter of fact, the fact that he raises him from the dead, people forget this, uh, Lazarus has to go through death a second time. <laughs> so it's not just to cure death because we're going to die. We live in a broken world. That's the result of a broken world. God wants to cure this issue of death for all time. And that's why as Christians, we believe he's coming back. Because when he comes back, Christ will set the world correct, the right way, the way it was intended from the beginning. And death is and evil will be put down forever and the world will be right and no one will have to ever have to experience that suffering again. We see it also in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. And here's what it says about Jesus. While Jesus was here on earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. And in this way, God qualified him as the perfect, as a perfect high priest. And he became the source of eternal salvation 
for all those who obey him. And so this is not something God wished upon him. This is not something that every Christian absolutely has to go through, but it speaks to the power of the gospel that Jesus sets the pathway that he went through something on our behalf. This is how God enters into our experience. And for many people, time and time again, as a pastor, as a preacher, even as a Christian, I can't tell you the countless times I've come across people in the worst, uh, unimaginable loss. And yet when there's a word spoken about Christ, when there's a word about God's presence and able to lift a burden, how people come to God, how people rethink what life is all about and how people make decisions for Christ or even go deeper in their walk with Christ. It's one of the major ways that God uses to make himself real in the lives of people because we can be so caught up into our routines that God can be screaming at the top of his voice right in front of us and we cannot hear him. And so God uses suffering to enter the human condition. Number two, God uses suffering to refine character and build faith. <laughs> we don't like suffering, but the truth is God uses suffering to develop us, to make us stronger and even to make us stronger people of faith. For whatever reason, I'll be the first one to say, I'd love to get faith in a classroom. I'd love to get in a sermon uh, on Sunday morning. I'd love to get in a Bible study. But the truth is, it's usually when we've gone through those difficult places that we learn to pray. We learn to depend on God. We learn to seek out other brothers and sisters in Christ to support us in our time of need. Excuse me. There's something about suffering and trial that God uses it uh, to build and to refine our character and our faith in him. And so here I, I want to give you um, uh, Romans uh, 5, uh, 2 through 3 he says, though, when we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand and we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only not only so, but all, we also glory in our suffering. So Paul here obviously indicating that the very things that we go through, the suffering that may be painful, God has a way of using it to build our character. Uh, we also see this with Paul in Philippians 3 verse 10, who at the time when he wrote this uh, Philippian letter, he was under Roman authority. He was under Roman custody. And here's what he says, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed uh, to his death. And so here Paul is saying that all that I go through, I see something deeper going on. I see something greater. I see the, the hand of God in my life like the priest having his hand on a sacrifice. He's shaping me. He's forming me. He's making me more like him. And so here we see God working a purpose in refining character as well as refining our, our, uh, our faith. Uh, one of my um, favorite scriptures I want to read to you is 1 Peter 4 and 12. Uh, and here's how Peter says it. Dear friends, don't be surprised. <laughs> King James would say, don't think it's strange at the fiery trials you are going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for those trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. And so here, uh, Paul says, it's a branding work. It's a branding. God is branding us with the struggles we go through and bringing us through in such a way that we become more like him and we represent him well in the earth. And so that's how it works. The Buddha says, hey, suffering is an illusion and you got to have these disciplines and you got to create this experience of life in such a way that you live detached from the world. You live detached from experience. You live detached from desire. Well, you know what that means. You're going to live detached from your loved ones. You, you can't even share love. You can't even take the risk of love, of, of, of sharing your heart with somebody or being loved by somebody. And that's the nature of life. Life is full of risk. And how can we possibly live life without any risk? So that's what the Buddhist said. The Hindu says, no, karma will fix all suffering in time. That is the belief, there's the belief that the proportion of our suffering is due to the proportion of our sins. 
And I don't know about you. I don't need to live under that weight. You know, I've done some things I'm not proud of. Uh, I have sinned just like anybody else. I'm just as flawed as like anybody else. But I'm grateful that I have forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. And I don't have to sit around and worry, well, am I going to pay for this in the next life? Uh, Are my children going to pay for this in the next life? That is not the gospel. The gospel cleanses us. It forgives us and cleanses us from all sin. And so you see these different traditions have different ways of approaching suffering. And, And one writer really, I thought, did a great job of trying to illustrate how suffering works. And he compared it to how our body learns how to handle viruses, viruses. And so, a uh, matter of fact, this week, I'm, I'm slowly getting over a cold virus. Last week was pretty brutal. Got through it. It's not COVID. It's not pneumonia or anything like that. It's not even the flu. Doctor told me, he says, you just have a nasty cold virus and a little bit of hay fever. And that's what kind of amplifies it. And so I'm fighting this virus. And so I never shall forget what the doctor said. He says, you know, I can give you some prescriptions here, but you know, those are only going to deal with the symptoms. It never gets to the core. Core. The only way that you're going to get over this cold is that the cold has to run its course. And basically what he was saying is that God has so designed our immune system that, yes, we we get the initial brunt of a virus. It can knock us down. It can take uh, our energy. Uh, It can give us fevers and we're not feeling well. But in time, our immune system actually processes the virus and it adapts and actually learns from it and gives us strength so that it can fight the virus on its own. And actually that immune system is using that virus to prepare us for future viral attacks that our immune system may be strong and healthy. They say the worst thing you can do is isolate yourself. But it's actually when you go in the midst of of community that your body actually learns how to fight viruses. And I said, boy, that is an ex- a, a ample illustration of how our faith works. Our faith was never designed to work in isolation, but our faith works and gets stronger as it goes through difficulty. Yes, it feels beaten down. We feel lonely. We feel abandoned. We feel forsaken. Sometimes we even feel that God doesn't hear us. But it's not that God doesn't hear us. It's what God sees in us. He sees a strong faith. He sees a faith that is growing and maturing. And he says, look, if I just give it time, it's just like your immune system. It's going to adapt. It's going to grow. It's going to get stronger. And it's going to overcome this current suffering and trial that you're going through. But it's also going to be best equipped to handle future suffering and trial. You'll have a greater faith. You'll have a greater and a stronger victory because of what God has placed in us. And so the Christian view that I think is far more consistent with reality is that God uses suffering to refine our character and our faith. Number three, suffering forces us to refocus our lives on what is important. I always say to a lot of people when they're going through difficulty, and I mean, it's heart wrenching, it's painful. I always ask the question, what exactly is God saying in terms of the priorities of your life? That's the question that is always thrown at me when I go through my own difficulties. When I had my own blood clot issues and even my eye issues, Uh, in terms of all the different transplants that I've gone through. And I've had numerous transplants to the point I've almost lost count. (laughs) Almost every five or seven years, I got to have a cornea transplant. Otherwise, I would be legally blind. And I, I find myself pausing in those moments, asking the question, am I dedicating my life to what's really important? Or am I wasting my life on things that don't matter? I think that's one of the big reasons God allows suffering. The truth is it takes suffering sometimes to get our attention. We can be so locked into our digital and our social routines that we don't even have time to think about what is different and what's best. And so I take it sometimes that what God is doing, he's using the suffering to cause us to pump the brakes, to pause and wait a minute, think about what's important in life. 
And my brothers and sisters, I want to pause here for a minute and just hit this little footnote for you. If you're going through trial, whether it's financial, whether it's health, whether it's personal, uh, whether you sense you feel a sense of abandonment from God, m- maybe what God is doing, he's trying to get you to stop. He's trying to get you to pause, you know, disconnect from your digital devices, disconnect even from friends and family and go into isolation and maybe spend some time in silence and let the emotional dust in your life settle for just a minute and, and kind of recapture what is important in life. Give yourself a chance to breathe for a moment and say, am I building my life toward the things that really matter? And I believe the one thing that ought to matter most to all of us is a life dedicated to serving Christ and his cause. That's just me because I'm a Christian and I believe it with all my heart. And I believe it's the best life anyone can live. I believe it's the best life that offers peace. Peace. It doesn't mean you ain't going to run into some bad Christians just like you're going to run into some good Christians. Welcome to reality. Welcome to the real world. But I truly believe the faith is definitely worth living. And lastly, and I think this may be the most important one, why does a good God allow suffering? And here's where I see his his supreme goodness. God allows suffering because he wants his grace to be given within the context of human freedom. Put another way, suffering is God's grace with our human freedoms. In a word, God does not want robots. God does not want automatons. God does not want us coerced in serving him. He's looking for willing and open hearts. And I think that's one of the number one reasons why he doesn't, why he allows suffering. I really believe with all my heart. In other words, the world, in a sense, doesn't want any influence by anything supernatural. So God says, fine, I'll let you do it on your own because I want you to make a decision on your own volition. I don't want it to be said or even indicated or hinted that somehow my presence, my grace, my blessings, my intervention unfairly or unduly influenced a person in the direction they didn't want to go. That's how much God loves us. God loves us so much that he actually gives us the freedom to turn our backs on him. I don't know any other faith that's willing to say that. And that's how I know Christianity is so real. And that's why I serve it. Because here God shows the epitome of his love, the the height, I shouldn't say epitome, the height of his love in that he says, look, I'll let you go if that's what you want to do. It's kind of like that father with the prodigal son, the boy, oldest boy, the younger boy was ready to leave. And you know what he did? He let him go and he didn't follow him. That's love. That's what he does. And he gives us that freedom. And so I would argue here, I put a couple of things here that a lot of suffering. Now, surely we we probably cannot influence how babies are born with certain brain deficiencies, things like that. We probably can't influence earthquakes. But I wonder sometimes, you know, we're getting pretty sophisticated with our seismic graphs and, and how we even understand what's going on geologically in our earth. Uh, how we understand the weather. You know, God has been tremendously gracious right there. Uh, But there are clearly some things that we can say, okay, that's part of creation. Why does God allow that? But just on the poverty alone, the wealth alone, even just in America and the West, is enough to wipe out all poverty in the world. That includes you and me. We're not talking about the billionaires, because usually when I say wealth, we think billionaires. (laughs) But no, do you know 92% of the people on this planet do not even own a car? So if you own a car, do you know you're wealthy? (laughs) You're wealthy. (laughs) If you drive a car, it could be a beat up 62 Ford. But if it's rolling, you're wealthy. You're wealthy. So really, it's a word about those who have the wealth and who really are unwilling to share that wealth with those who are less fortunate and those who are in need. And what breaks my heart is you have Christians even building a biblical theology as if somehow Christians have absolutely no responsibility to help people who are in need. And yet when Jesus came to this earth, 
He didn't go to the wealthy. He went to the marginalized. He went to the poor. He went to the left out. He went to the people that most people would forget. He, he went to those with the poor reputations, whether it was prostitutes or tax collectors, those that people didn't want to have anything to do with. That's who Jesus spent his time with. And, and so here in terms of the wealth problems and even how we solve our social problems, if we were to put them toward those issues that causes the greatest trauma and pain in our world, I believe we can solve a lot of things. I mean, if we can put people into a space shuttle and put a man on the moon and we're sending satellites to the Mar to Mars, then surely, surely we can deal with some of the economic problems and other problems, political problems that we have on our planet today. But humanity is selfish. He's sinful. He wants it all for himself. He's not sharing a penny of it. And that's one of the reasons why wealth persists. I'm not suggesting at all that somehow no one has a right to pursue uh, financial gain. There's a place for that. But in the biblical or Christian worldview, that is always balanced with compassion. And so those are just a few pointers that I hope you would, uh, I hope would encourage you and you can go back and think about it. Uh, why does a good God allow suffering? Ultimately, it's because he loves us and he wants us to make a personal uh, uninfluenced or unpressured choice to love him and to serve him. God bless you. And I'll be looking for you in the next video. Take care.